I'm tired of you dropouts. I'm tired of you good for nothing, sleeping on your baby mama's couch, baggy jean below your knees wearing, with the tattoos on your face and gut, illiterate, backwards reading, backwards writing, manipulative, conniving, stealing my tax dollars, having babies back to back, holding up the bus with their strollers. Cell phone texting, fresh weave wearing, Newport smoking, YouTube watching, status updating every three to five minutes with misspelled words that brag about what you ain't doing. Weed smoking, weed toting, red top selling, nickel and dime gangsters with their free mixtapes for sale on the subway. Lil Wayne and Nicki Minaj loud on repeat. Chinese chicken eating, corner store hugging, sorry excuse for a human being. Dropout. The heck is a dropout? Besides a quitting waste of space. Tired of you damn dropouts. Pushouts. Dropouts. These are two words commonly used to describe young people who are for one reason or another no longer engaged in the conventional school system. In Philadelphia today, 40% of high school students fail to graduate. A lot of people talk about the dropout rate, but many do not ask why this rate is so high or think beyond popular stereotypes about dropouts. We are trying to change the way people view dropouts. Mostly minorities. Uh, say low life. You know, not worth the time. In fact, we don't even like the term dropout because it carries so many negative stereotypes. So in high school, it's like, oh, they dropped out. You know, you think that there's something, there's something bad about them. But what I've learned through my students is that everybody has a story and that, you know, there's nothing happens in anyone's life in isolation. So yes, they're not in school, but why? This documentary project is basically redefining the term dropout. We students of Yes Philly actually view ourselves as pushouts. I think that once you learn people's stories, you, you become more aware and you you know you, you realize that all the stereotypes are just that, they're stereotypes. So I think it helps to end a lot of the stereotypes when you get to hear the students' stories. This is our story. Of our experience. Told from our point of view. Stereotypes say we don't embrace the education, never mention how the schools play a part in the situation. The role that the school district plays is they have to structure a child's life from kindergarten to 12th grade. And when I say structure it, to instill in them the, the necessities it takes to succeed. It's in trouble and um, it has moved more to a financial based um, environment where decisions about student learning um, and the opportunities that students will have are being based made based on money. It's going to get worse for a while because of cuts in the, the funding, state budget, city budget, school district budget. I feel like it's setting everybody up, our city, our society, our country up for failure if you're, you're funding prisons as opposed to education. I feel like if you fund people to have education or to be uh, more educated, there, there won't be a need for prisons. Well, one, when you have additional funding, it provides young people an opportunity to have more, more, resources, more resources in their school. So if you're talking about going to college, if you're talking about career, after school career programs, all that comes from funding. If you're talking about having smart boards in the classroom, laptops in the classroom, well, all, which all contributes to having a quality education, that comes from having a significant amount of funding to support the resources that young people need. It's a terrible problem. I, I, I'm not sure just throwing more money is the answer. Um, I think the school system, at least in Philadelphia, is bloated with a bureaucracy. I have a 
brother-in-law who's a teacher in the public schools and some of the horror stories he tells me are awful. <laughs> it's like any other big organization is just bloated and bureaucratic instead of, I think there's some teachers they need to get rid of who are terrible and there's definitely a lot of administrators, a lot of dead wood in that system. There is a big push around testing, about test results, um, you know, materials, supplies, school culture challenges, environment challenges. Um, yes, of course, there are challenges with students, um, but I think that moreover the challenges are based on problems with the adults you know, uh, the structure or the, just the, the school climate with the other teachers, the principals, superintendents, et cetera. I don't put blame on the school district, it's confining me to this, the school district, because this is, this is my classroom, and it's been my classroom for almost 20 years. I'm gonna teach my students to the best of my ability with what I know, but I don't, I don't place blame and I don't let politics outside my classroom, you know, dictate what I'm gonna do for my students because my students are individual entity in all of this and as a group they are and as individuals they are. It'll take a long time but I think at some point it's going to get to be a system where there's a lot more variation, there's a lot more different kinds of schools but I think we're going to have a setback in the next few years. Well, I wouldn't want to go to school if I didn't have a textbook when that's what we're working off of. You know, if the ceiling is falling in on me, if the toilets are stopped up, you know, if the teachers aren't any good, if all the best teachers leave because they can't be paid, um, if the workers are miserable to be there because, you know, be because they're not being paid properly and not being treated properly, you know, I, it's no wonder that, that people end up leaving. From our research, we've discovered four major themes that are recurrent contributions to the push-out crisis. Teaching and classroom learning, boredom and engagement, discipline and climate, and out-of-school issues. I would define um, a push-out in two ways. One, there are students who are um, who show up at school on the beginning of the school year. They're informed that they're not on the roster. They're sent to the re-engagement center. They have no idea why they're on, not on the school roster. And then they're sent to out-of-school youth programs like here at E3 West. Um, so those are some situations. And then there are other situations where there are students who are really eager to learn, but the school climate or the, the environment in their school is such that it's just not conducive to learning. So there's fights every day or there's a, a constant rotation of substitute teachers. So they, they feel like they have no other option but to stop going to that school for their safety or for whatever reason. So I would not constitute those students as dropouts because they, they just weren't able to continue their education by no fault of their own. Why do you think a majority of the students leave school? Yeah, some people probably just don't like, some people get picked on, like some people get picked on. Some people love school. Some people is made of school. Like school, some people can go to and can do their thing at. But like quarter of them is picked on. Half of them probably don't bang with school at all. Some of them just turn into like just stop caring because if they just give up after a while, like once they, it's hard. But it's easy to give up because it's like no, it's encouragement, but it's like it's no help. Like I think it's gonna keep dropping out more. I thought it dropping out so many times. Like when you learn their stories and their home environments and the circumstances with which they deal with in their communities and you know what their school experience was like. I had one student who had like 10 substitute teachers in a year, you know. And then I test my students and I find they're that you know they're 19 and they're reading on the third grade reading level. It's like, you know, I see why you're here. What opportunities did you have? And and I want to know what your kindergarten first and second grade teachers were doing collecting a check and you clearly didn't learn how to read. I mean, you go through school, they'll pass you knowing that you can't read. Like, you'll be in 12th grade people who who not literate at all. You know what I mean? I mean, I know y'all hear, like, people read out loud, and you be like, how do they get to where they at? Like, when you be in math class or you be in reading class and they reading out loud and they stumbling over the most simplest words, it's because they, they pass you because they want you out their face. I think it's mostly, like, outside influences. I don't know, because I know a couple of people who are, like, considered dropping out or want to or have. And it's mostly because, like, they see, like, um, I guess, adults or other people who haven't been to high school and, um, and they're doing perfectly fine in life now. And I think they see that and I think they, like, 
they um, they think that they can do that too. And I, I mean, and it's completely understandable because some people can just not go to high school and still live like a perfectly fine life. I think some people drop out because either the work is not capturing them or it's either too hard or they can't get into it. Why did you push out? Because it wasn't interesting. It was boring. Teaching got on my nerves. But why do you think a lot of youth push out? They're not interested. School boring. I teach them. Teachers don't teach. They throw you a book and just say, huh? And do this, find a definition, do all that. Traditional school, it's very straightforward, like brick and mortar. This is all you're going to do. It's kind of that standard relationship. You view the teachers as cops more than companions. There was a lack of discipline in the school system. I wasn't really attentive because well, we weren't really going over anything due to disciplinary problems. So for me, it got to the point where, you know, I'd be learning more at home. It got so depressing because, like, it's a waste of life, a waste of time, that I just stopped uh, attending on time and then all together. They staff feels as if they got a lot of power and they abuse their authority. They come at kids differently like they're their parents, and it's just like the way they come off and the tone of their voice gives a lot of kids the, the unwelcoming feeling. It's ridiculous. You know, the way that um, the youth have been getting pushed out of schools, especially young African Americans um, in, in this society. Um, I went to high school in a school where, um, where basically they, I turned 18 and they came and told me like, well, since you're 18 now, legally we don't have to keep you here as a student, but you can be a student here up to 21, but we don't have to keep you here. But they're like, if you're late to class one time or anything, we're going to kick you out of all um, public schools. And that's what they did to me. I had a different situation. Uh... I'm me, I, I like to call myself a nerd, like I, I had honors classes, I made honor roll, I was sort of the jock, the popular kid, and then just everything changed with like my cousin, he put his gun in my book bag and that, that got me expelled, like that changed everything. So. There were many reasons for dropping out. You seen and heard that it was tough. Now let us tell you our perspective, how it impacted us. I got pushed out for my own personal problems. And, um, well, when I was 14, I got raped. So I was in the ninth grade. And I never really told anybody about it. So I kind of just kept it in and it started affecting me. So I started coming to school late or just not coming at all. It really, just, I just got depressed. I never really had a father figure, like, Speaking of the siblings that I, you know, tend to, they're mostly female, so there's, there's no, you know, really didn't have any father figure around, you know, to really guide me and keep me on track as a man. It wasn't really a structure for me, and it was a different environment from coming from Catholic school to public school. It was just too much freedom. I couldn't agree with it. It was just too much for me to handle. I was raised good. I had a, a very good role models. I had plenty of people to look up to. I just was being hard-headed and doing what I wanted to do, not realizing that I was affecting my future. Unfortunately, I was arrested my last three months of my 12th grade year, but it led me down the wrong path and forced me out. I was getting a lot of fights. My mom made a decision to put me in homeschool, so it didn't work out, paid them the money, they didn't send the books. And it just happened from there. School wasn't giving me money. School wasn't feeding me. School wasn't, you know, putting clothes on me and everything like that. So I just took it as like school was in the way. Plus, being as though my, I didn't like my teacher and the thing that he taught, and which was the main thing for me to pass, I wasn't passing it. So I just said, forget it. And I was messing with girls. You know, that was another downfall, too. <laughs> Being around the wrong crowd, doing the wrong things, um, just chilling with people that was a real bad influence on me and just making my character something that's not really who I am. And I was sugarcoating it, you know, doing things that I wasn't really supposed to be doing, smoking, drinking, doing stuff, you know, that I wasn't supposed to do at the age that I was. So. I started, I guess, doing drugs. Um, then I started getting into alcohol. Pretty much everything I was doing it. I did it because I was depressed, but in the same breath I was putting myself in even more bad situations. 
robberies here, and then just dumb stuff. Like, like at the while, like you will get tired of it. Like it just comes to the point. Like every day, every month, every week, every year, you you don't get younger, and it comes to the point like something got to give. Is either you want to do something about you know trying to become something, or you're just going be another statistic out here trying to find a way to get where you want to go. I looked at myself in the mirror one day and I just didn't like what I saw. It was it was a bad picture like to see yourself like this and hear people telling you stories about yourself that you don't remember, you know? So it's just like, wow, that was me. <laughs> it's embarrassing. So I started like looking down on myself but I realized it really didn't have to be that way. Like, I just, I needed to get back on track and I know I'm not getting any younger. So it was just, I had to do it, you know? Well, I decided that after I got out of jail because while I was in there, I had a lot of wise people in there that spoke to me. My life now, it actually gives me that little push that I need to move on and do what I got to do because it just showed me that you never know when you're going to go. Because my dad was young when he passed. He was like 42. So, I mean, it just basically gave me that stepping stone to know that I need to get my stuff together and it's not too much time to waste. Time waits for no man. My first pregnancy was twins. And my son didn't make it and my daughter did. Being as though my son didn't make it, when I first, when, we, when she got pregnant, that taught me that, you know, it's time to, it's time to grow up. So that made me turn into a man and go back to school, look for jobs, you know, uh, paying rent, you know, asking my mom to teach me how to do this for when I get my own to take care of my children. And, you know, it was just a lot of stuff that made me grow up. You can, like, people always tell you, you know, stay in school, do this, you need to do this, and da da da. Yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> it sounds great, but it's, it's not that easy. So, like I said, I think what influenced me was myself just seeing the negative side of me wanted to bring the positive side of me out. When, when my nephew was born, it was just like, and my brother got locked up, it was just like, all right, it's time to go back to school. I did everything out here, there's nothing else to do. I'm bored. People are fighting to improve the public school system, but we must remember there are alternatives to mainstream education here in Philadelphia. There's a lot of community service and volunteer things they can do, and that will actually help them get jobs because you can put that on your resume and it looks very good. I mean, it shows that you're not lazy and that you're responsible. Then, I mean, there's also the alternative of going to an alternative school, like Yes, the Yes program, there's the E3 Center, there's um, GED programs and CCP and Delaware County Community College. I mean, they have plenty of opportunities. Being at an alternative program, um, I would identify some of the differences as be, being that each one of my students is an individual. So it's more targeted teaching and learning um, happening here. Um, each one of my students has a portfolio where we work on skills that they specifically need to work on. There's not this generalized, this is the lesson, this is a class full of 25 people, and I'm just going to teach the lesson. It's more targeted. The students come in, we do three different individualized assessments. We do instruction based on the assessments. We take notes, we follow up, and so there's more attention for each individual student. A lot of people got skills and talents that they don't know that they have. People think that high school dropouts are a really, really hard group to work with and that, you know, they're going to be really hard to teach and they're going to have all sorts of behavioral problems and, you know, they're going to be the hardest group of teenagers to work with and I think they're the easiest group of teenagers to work with and they've had a chance to see that, you know, it's not all about, you know, just so, uh, who's going to make me do something that you got to do things for yourself and you have to decide, you have to make decisions and you have to, you know, think about your future. Like, I don't think we do anything for students here. We just create an environment where they can do things for themselves. If you're not in school, then you're not going to learn that. You're not going to have the ability to, like, art right, this new certain job come along and it's paying a good, 
good amount of money and you really want that job and you don't qualify for it, it's like, well, what did I come here for? Like, well, how do I'm going to take care of my house or your kids or whatever you have down the line? School is the start of a new life. Right? I think relationships with teachers helps a lot. Like, if you have te student teacher interaction, it helps a lot because students feel like they have someone to talk to and they have someone to go to if they need a pro if they need help solving something. There was a teacher there called Miss um, Blount, and she was actually my science teacher. And she pushed me and pushed me and pushed me like to the point like I just keep coming to her class like. Not to actually just start coming and start coming and doing the work like, like she just wouldn't give up on me. That's what I needed. There's nothing that can really stand in your way if you work towards your goal, and as long as you have, you know, the support and the help. And that's one thing I had growing up. I had support and help, and I try to offer that to my students. If they don't have it at home, if they don't have it in in the building that they're in, to offer them the support that they need as a student and as a person. Like, they are people. <laughs> you know, they're, they're people first and they're students second. So I, I try to treat, treat them like that. I really believe in the importance of education, especially public education, in this city and everywhere, but this is my home. Um, I think part of the vision for the Campaign for Nonviolent Schools is that there would be funding and resources um, to create relationships that could support students who are struggling. And I feel like right now when students struggle, they get punished or they get sort of pushed by the wayside and then, you know, why would you want to stay in school if you don't feel like people are there to support you when you struggle? So that's something I think is really important. Nobody wants to be ignored and when you're somewhere and you're not feeling a part of, it's easier to walk away. And when you have full class, when you have um, classes with overrunning with children, how many of those children are feeling left out? We need to make sure that one, we have an environment where young people can learn. So if our schools are unsafe, then young people can't learn. I'm, I'm out here today to support resources and opportunities for young people to feel safe. My vision of a nonviolent school is a school that includes input from, from all the people who are involved in it, from the students, from the parents, from the teachers, from the people who work at the school, you know, to really make an environment that is, that is good for learning and good for working in and, you know, it supports people's humanity. It can't be just um, schools doing it, it has to be a partnership. It has to be parents as well as, as, as the school's official to make that difference. The school district cannot police parents. You can hold them accountable for their role in their child's life. But if they could influence the role of the parent and to offer parenting classes to those students that are, you know, having children in high school, because their children are eventually going to go to school, and that cycle is vicious. I never really had a father figure in my life to actually do good work. He was in and out of the system, which is I'm in and out of the system. Um, he has kids, I might have kids. Um, he did bad things as far as drug relations and you know so forth. I'm doing the same thing. Like I'm just trying to put a different. I'm trying to. He waited to the. He waited the wrong time to try to better himself. Like, I'm trying to do it early while I still got the chance to. So I think if you have a lot of positive people by your side, you know, people that are doing something with themselves, then I think that would actually help a lot. Keep an open mind, you know, to people's advice maybe. And I think that'll keep you on the right track. Despite all the stereotypes we face and the issues with the educational system today, it is important for us to define ourselves. We are intelligent individuals working hard toward our goals in life to realize success. I just want to be happy. <laughs> I want to be happy and I want to be comfortable. I want to be stable. I want kids and I want them to live better than I did. You know, and I think once I have that, that's when I will feel success. Years from now, I see myself sitting in a carpet chair, running my own business. Achieving my goals as far as getting, completing my GED, going to college, you know, having financial stability for me and my children, uh, you know, having a, a, having a happy home where my kids can always come to. I've been trying to get into some type of electrician 
you know, type of job or program, um, culinary, um, carpentry. Like, I'm just trying to be a renaissance man, like just do everything. Try to keep a positive mindset and just know that you are worth something. You know, like a lot of people, I don't think that they feel that they're worth it. So they don't strive to go further in life or they really will just settle for, I guess, less. And um, I don't want them to feel that way. Like they're not alone. There's always people that they could talk to. You just gotta keep an open mind. You know, you just, you have to be willing. Like, this is not the life you want to do, trust me, because I've been through it, and I've been going through it for years, six to seven years now, and there's nothing good coming out of it, so please, please, just do, do what you can. Like, make your education your top priority. Keep your chin up, chest out, and feet flat on the ground, and, you know, stay focused, stay positive, uh, have, a, have, a, have a stable mentality. You know, take care of your responsibilities. If you don't know your responsibilities, sit there and think about it and find them. And once you find them, you'll know where to go from there. Always stay smart, just made bad decisions. I ain't have to pay for nothing, now I gotta pay tuition. Coulda ran for track, woulda been one of the top runners. Bad decision was picking up the port and getting the puffin. People couldn't tell me nothing, I was changed in my ways. Which was natural for my age, went to fade from braids. Introduced to marijuana, started puffing for days, and then I started slacking school, feeling stuck in a maze. All I felt was pain, scratching and surviving blood rushing through my veins, stress killing the brain. Now I learned from my mistakes, I feel no more shame, but it's it's a shame how I was stuck getting money in a weed game. An opportunity opened up, yes, Y-E-S. Had to get my life straight, pass my GD test. My life experience for me been some bad, some good. That's what happens when you hugging your strip and stuck in the hood. I got my mind right, money right, hugging on my kids tight. After high school slacking, I had to hop back on my bike. No matter if it was a hike, everything now was going right. Yet I'm still up on my bike trying to live a perfect life. Didn't care like what's the reason. Now I got kids, I gotta do this for a reason. But I got more reasons. Chin up, chest out, feet flat on the ground. We in Robinson, the public defender. How that sound?